uh, it's, it's great to have every, everyone here and we're looking forward to a, a good conversation. Uh, what Nora and I uh, want to do is share some uh, research that we've been doing. Uh, it started with quite modest expectations and is morphing in some unpredictable ways. Uh, and, and one of our goals here is to share kind of what's emerging and get you to respond and help us think about what it means in terms of implications for individuals as well as for a place like us. Uh, so we're looking forward to that conversation in, in particular. The formal title of this session is New Lessons on Life and Career from Today's Most Respected Leaders, and we'll certainly try to deliver against that. Uh, the, uh, the working uh, title is uh, Beware the Tyranny of the Straight Line, and uh, we'll spend a lot of time uh, delving, delving into that. That was a quote from uh, Janet Napolitano, who is now the uh, president of the University of California uh, system and we thought gosh that's really profound but being slightly academically oriented we said well did she really create that or did it come from someplace else so we went back and did a little research and it in fact comes uh, from an Austrian artist and designer by the name of Hundert Wasser uh, and he actually his name is the name he's created and it has about actually six components but that's his uh, his, his uh, recognized name uh, and in what he wrote was in 1953 he realized that the straight line leads to the downfall of mankind. Now we'll decide if that's uh, as profound as he felt it was. Uh, but the straight line has become an absolute tyranny. The straight line is something drawn by cowards without a, with, without a rule or with a rule. Um, it is done without thought or feeling. It is a line that does not exist in nature. So t whether we'll pass the test of uh, his ultimate quote, which is the straight line is the foundation that will doom our entire civilization. Uh, I'm not sure we'll rise to that, te rise to that test, but uh, that's the roots from which we, uh, we come with our, our, our conversation. Uh, so we've been uh, fully fully introduced, and I, <laughs> I won't spend anything uh, more uh, more on that. But uh, what we'd ask as we go through this conversation, uh, we'd like you to think about three questions. You know, are these findings valuable, believable, and or valuable uh, to wherever you are uh, in your career? Are that we'd like to talk and get your thoughts on what are the challenges on acting on these insights. And then lastly, what should a place like Haas do to help students incorporate this kind of mindset into their, into their career? Okay, and we want to start with asking you to think about the most interesting leaders you have met and what makes them interesting. Just take a moment, think about the most interesting leaders you've met. What were their backgrounds? Did their experiences contribute to their being interesting? So we'd like to hear from some of you. We want to bring leadership into the room. Leadership in a very real way. People you know. People who have done something that you admire. Please. I worked with a guy named Don Swanson, and you've never heard of him. But he was a really effective sales manager. In that, as a sales guy, he was too big. Now is the time. And his strength as a leader was developing each of us. Okay. And I think that was the huge thing in the mind when you asked the question. Okay, great example. So somebody really who was tuned in to the people he was selling things to and the people he was working with. Any idea about his background or how he got to be that way? Like me, he was an engineer. Okay. I went into marketing, he went into sales. I okay. working with him in, in the marketing. Office. Okay. And okay. It was, it was having those skills but being about people. Being, ah, having the skills but being about people. Okay, good. In the back. Um, I was uh, one time at, at the Aerospace Museum at the Smithsonian. I was uh, invited by the only Saudi astronaut to uh, orbit uh, the Earth to go to an astronaut party. <coughs> and in that astronaut party, there were 200 astronauts from around the world, and including the Gregorian from Russia. And he had 
20 of his affiliate associates that they were all, they're mm -hmm. all sitting around. This was after dinner, we're drinking. Okay. They were drinking, they were watching the film. And these guys are all laughing at different, they were showing the space shots to the moon and coming back and they were joking about the different people they knew from different countries who were on these different uh, expeditions and they knew who was getting nervous uh -huh. and who was throwing up uh -huh. and who could hold their natural uh, excrement movements you uh -huh. know, at certain times and so they were joking around but this this one head guy you can tell had extreme strength and peace and how could you tell that you could tell that you just I could tell that because I could feel it mm -hmm. coming through him. okay okay thank you another one yes <clears throat> well one of my uh, one of my managers was a uh, vice president of the market research firm and he had a project manager in background, so he was very analytical, like a PMI certification or whatever. But what he did really well was he had a very high sense of EQ, emotional intelligence and the social intelligence. Especially, he would go around to where we were in our obviously a cubicle kind of format, and he would touch base with us uh -huh. and just find out how we were doing, uh -huh. what obstacles were in our way, and he would be an advocate for us in meetings that you know we weren't on. He was part of the leadership team. He represented us well. We felt he had our back. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I'm not sure if it was an exact background. I don't know if the PMI part came in, because that's, that's the analytical, but he had a very high social intelligence. I think it was partially he had been a consultant, so he was used to kind of probing, and he was also um, teaching a PMI course at NYU at the time, which was back east. So I think maybe that lent itself to just being a little bit knowing how to touch base with with different people, but I just think it was, he built it up, right? He just had this innate high SQ, EQ. Okay, quoted. okay. So it may have been in his DNA, but he certainly built it up in these other experiences, but you think. he did a think. really great job of bringing us together as a group uh -huh. and touching base with us individually so that we felt connected. Okay, okay, so he really built the team. Yes, one more. Uh, I worked for a guy named Gary Logan more than 10 years ago. He was a uh, business school professor turned casino executive. <laughs> of course he was, right? <laughs> He's living the life. <laughs> For a long time. Uh, the underlying premise of him leaving is while teaching, uh, and a lot of his work was based on how to use data to measure consumer loyalty and then affect change. Well, the president of the company that he was consulting for it, a couple of years after listening to this, this guy who exuded professor I wasn't in the room, this is how I imagine it goes. At some point he said, shut up. Either come over and work full time for us or stop giving me the same speech. Okay. okay. And the guy quit academia, joined first as COO and then CEO, and he changed an industry. Wow, that's impressive. Any idea what led him to do that? It's a big um, jump. His, um, this sound a bit cool. Uh, his dispassionate sense of a business as a bunch of moving parts and data independent of people uh -huh. allowed him to make really what felt like emotionally really difficult decisions. We're going to move this here, okay. move this here, and change this and blow up this. Even if the industry has been 50 years old, it didn't matter uh -huh. because he had a hypothesis that he was going to test. Right. Right, so he could see something, even as a business school professor, that he was then able to really apply given his view of the world. Okay. I'd, li I'd like to talk a little bit about how I came to this and some of these same observ observations. It was the, the how for I entered the research question. I spent 25 years at, at McKinsey, as was mentioned, and I thought I, I thought about the people I most respected uh, at McKinsey, and you know, a very diverse group of folks. And I said, why why do I find these particular people interesting? And one of the things, and I call it McKinsey's dirty little secret, uh, because they're back, when you ask them what they did, they rarely talked about the consulting. They talked about all the other stuff they were doing outside of their consulting uh, day job. And they were doing fantastic stuff working with, um, on public commissions or working on uh, leading nonprofits. Uh, it, you know, running small businesses on the side, it was all the other stuff. Yet at McKinsey, you never talked about that. 
those are the things that you did and you kept away from your partners because they were pretty certain that that would be, the fear was that you were taking your time away from your day job and that would affect uh, how people viewed you. Um, but lo and behold, some of the very best were doing an awful lot of this. And it caused us to then think about how common is that uh, among leaders, particularly among respected leaders. Okay. And um, I came to it a little differently from being here at Haas and seeing that students and alumni were really struggling with what to do next and how do they cross boundaries between one sector and another and what, did they, what was transferable and what was not and wanted to understand that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the research and then I want you to hear from one of the people we interviewed and we'll tell you what we found. So we looked at building a database of leaders. And we wanted to be sure that these would be seen as leaders. Now, this is US-based, so that, that's the caveat, OK? But we wanted to look at 2,000 current leaders. So we took 1,549 of the C-level leaders from Fortune 200 companies, so CEOs and management team. Okay? And these figures represent the percentage of the population working in each sector. So most of the population works in corporate. That's why you see the heaviest representation here. We then looked at 188 nonprofit leaders. So we looked at the wealthiest 100 foundations and their presidents, the wealthiest nonprofits operating organizations and their executive directors. And then finally, we took 309 public sector leaders at very the state and federal level, those who were elected and appointed. So these were hundreds and hundreds, and we chose 300 randomly from that group. We'll tell you what they had to say in just a minute. But we then wanted to know, why did we get the results we got? And how do people understand their own lives and their own leadership and their own trajectories? There's more depth to this than we're getting in just the overview. So we wanted to know, we asked them, 20 to 25 people, explain this narrative of your life. You know, you started here, you went here, you ended up here. Explain that to us what the motivations were, what you were seeking. What were the costs to doing it the way you did it? What were the benefits? And any advice for next generation leaders, for organizations, and for particularly business schools and professional schools. Okay? And this is the kind of thing we got back. So this is Janet Napolitano, the president of UC, the person for whom this talk is named, the quote is from her. Beware the tyranny of the straight line. Now, she's not the first person to say it. You already heard where, where it came from. And we won't be the last to say it. But we want, you, want to give you a certain sense of, excuse me, of, um, of the importance of this. So I need some help here. If you click on that, will it work? It should. There we go. It was just taking a while. Give me a second, and you'll have it. So I could give you lots of advice, but I'm going to narrow it down to one point. Um, and that is, beware the tyranny of the straight line. Uh, now think about what you see when you're walking in Back Bay in late spring and you're looking out at the Charles or looking out over Boston Harbor in the summer. You see lots of sailboats. And if you watch them skimming the white caps, you will notice something important. Sailboats do not glide through the water in a straight line. They tack. They zigzag from here to there. And that's how they move forward. So in 2064, when you're wearing a golden robe and you return to Northeastern for your 50th reunion, my hope for you is that you will look back at the decades that have passed and see the twists and the turns, the tacking, that are the hallmark of a well-lived life. Now, I walked across my own undergraduate commencement stage at Santa Clara University in California in, um, uh, well, a number of years ago. <laughs> And I had no idea of the future that lay before me. I didn't have a job. I hadn't decided to go to graduate school. 
Um, I knew I wanted to do something in public service somehow, somewhere, uh, but the journey was just beginning. And the journey has taken me as no one would have identified then. They would not have identified that I would go to law school and move to Arizona, a state where I had never lived. Uh, they would not have identified that I would be in private law practice, um, but that President Clinton would ask me to be a United States attorney in Arizona. They would not have identified that uh, I would decide myself to take the biggest risk and that is to run for political office myself, and I hope some of you do, because I think you can do it better. <laughs> From attorney general to governor, two terms, well, one and a half, and then uh, service in President Obama's cabinet. And then, as president of the largest public research university in the country and perhaps the world, the University of California. Talk about zigging and zagging. That's a zig and a zag and a zig back. But the point is always moving forward and always thinking about not just yourself, but the difference you make for your family and friends, for your community, for the society, in which you live. I would say that it has been an exhilarating ride, and I would not have traded it for all the foresight and predictability in the world. Watch for the tyranny of the straight line. Stay alert to opportunities, especially the unexpected ones that will move you forward. After all, you may notice, those of you who sail, that when a sailboat tries to go straight, it's often caught in irons, and it slows to a stop. You want to move forward. You want to make a difference. Okay. So, Janet Napolitano came into our research not just because she's president of UC, in fact, not because she's president of UC. She came in because she was the head of Homeland Security at the point at which we were gathering, gathering information. So even in the small window in which we're gathering information, she has moved from a public sector job to a nonprofit sector job. And she is like many others. So, well, we weren't the first to think of the, the tacking concept. Uh, we wondered if that was just really well-intentioned advice from wise people, or if in fact leaders actually looked like that, that they use, really saw the tax. And so what we did is, as, as Nora said, we built a database. So we were looking at prevalence of cross-sector affiliations, and let me define what we mean. A cross-sector affiliation is, so if we were looking at a public sector leader, had they worked in the private sector? A, a corporate leader or a private sector leader, we'd ask, do they serve on a nonprofit board, uh, a public commission? Uh, did they, uh, were, were they ever a nonprofit leader, et cetera? So any one of those experiences we would describe as a cross-sector affiliation. And here's what we, we found. So just looking at corporate leaders, 58% of them were just, quote, corporate leaders. They had, we were not able to find any explicit cross-sector affiliations. The other 42% though, um, about 30% uh, had a, a one or more nonprofit affiliations, 5% had public, and 8% had all, uh, both public and private uh, affiliations. So this is just off of our publicly available data. What we did learn as we talked to folks that we were always low. Uh, they always had affiliations that we were not able to find from our search of the public record. So I believe all these numbers are, are low and I can't tell you by, uh, by how much. We looked at those leaders of, of nonprofit organizations. 38% of them had always been nonprofit uh, affiliated. 24% mostly came from the private sector, 17 from the public, and 21% had worked in both the public and private sector prior to be becoming a, the leader of a, a large nonprofit organization in the U.S. Of our public sector leaders, same kind of concept. 45% were primarily public sector, 
16% came out of the private sector, 17% had nonprofit affiliations, and almost a quarter of them had both nonprofit and public affiliations. So we, that seemed to us to be uh, indicative of an awful lot of leaders having these rich uh, set of multi sector experiences. We also learned some, uh, some other interesting uh, things. Women leaders were more likely than men to have cross-sector affiliations. Right, and we got some um, insights from some of the women leaders that we interviewed. Now I will say, we in, I, I'm sorry, that we looked at 2,000 leaders. That's, that's the group that you saw. About 200 of them were women. Okay, so think about top leadership in this country, it's about 10%, right? But this is what they said about why affiliations for women were higher no matter whether they were corporate, nonprofit, and public. They said things like, um, guys have a more straight career bent, okay? They're, they're just more straight line in how they think about things. Women generally have more connections to nonprofit mission they need more experience to be credible, and so they go on these little zigs and zags in order to get it. Um, they also said that they see life a little differently, because they still, in this, in this country, women still have primary care, generally, um, for children. So you're juggling more things, so juggling one more thing might not seem as different to them. We had other women say, Women are less likely, this was a woman in a law firm saying, women are less likely to say no, okay? And another person who's the president of the foundation said, um, you know, we just keep relationships for longer. And her example was that I had interviewed her and hadn't spoken to her in five years, right? But she said, but, but we say yes, because we keep up those, those relationships. Is it also because traditionally the men <coughs> make the money and the women that end up prote protecting the money, and the first generation men make tons of money, and then after, the, and they give it them to the wives to manage the foundation, that's or to their daughters. Right. right. I think that is an old view. I think that's, that that has been a historical issue. But think about the women we're talking to here. These are CEOs of something, so that's that's kind of not their own experience. We did see across our database, CEOs were more likely than non-CEOs to have uh, cross-sector affiliations, and they were more likely to have more cross-sector affili affiliations than non-CEOs. So they tend to be more connected. Some of that's related to the role, right? There's an expectation of CEOs to connect and have a role uh, in the community they, they, they play, and that's certainly uh, part of it. We also saw a group that, for lack of a better phrase, we called serial affiliators, right? So about 25% of our leaders had four or more cross-sectoral affiliations. And about five to 10%, depending on the sector, would have seven or more. So multiple uh, affiliations across sectors. I think our, our top affiliator had uh, 17 uh, different affiliations over the course of her, uh, her career. Her young career. Yeah, rel okay. yeah, exactly. I just want to bring these to life. So the, we, we saw a number of archetypes when we looked at these profiles and say, you know, what's the theme? How do you start to pull this together? We saw a number of archetypes and we'll illustrate them. So the first one was the sector hopper. Somebody who had worked in another sector and made a fairly significant change often to a leadership role in a different sector. Fairly common, you know, to see a, uh, a corporate person try and make that uh, make that shift. An example would be, um, you know, from our database, Mark Tursik. Uh, so Mark was a uh, Goldman Sachs managing director uh, based out of New York. Uh, he um, had, in, at the under the encouragement of John Whitehead, who was running Goldman Sachs at the time, joined uh, a nonprofit <coughs> board. Eventually, joined another nonprofit board. Helped them through some turnarounds and became very interested. At Goldman, he uh, he really started to get active in the environmental area and seeing if they could create a line of business around uh, around the environmental arena. Uh, and Mark was headhunted away to run the Nature Conservancy. So he hopped from the intense world of investment banking to the, uh, the, the Nature Conservancy. So that, and that's an archetype you see fairly often. Um, people who have, have completely shifted their profile. 
Right, so I'm going to talk about three of them. Down here is the community archetype. And one of our examples for this was Barbara DeSour. She's now at Citigroup, I believe, but was at Bank of America when we interviewed her. And what she said is she'd moved around for her career to different cities in the US a number of times. And the way that she got rooted in a new community was to join different nonprofit boards, to get involved in public commissions. Part of what really she really cared about in addition to the community, or, or specifically within the community, was education. So I know that she sits on three business school boards. You know, she's been involved in lots of educational efforts, but it was all for the purpose of really becoming part of a new community she was living in. Her job wasn't enough. So that's the, the community leader. Up in the middle, we have the heart. So this is the passion player. This is, a somebody, this is somebody who has a particular passion for an issue and just goes after it. So Roger Lomax, Michael Lomax. Michael Lomax. Sorry, Michael Lomax is president of UNCF. He's been there for a while. Before he was president of UNCF, which is a nonprofit, right? He worked in Georgia, which is his home state, and was an elected official. In an, he's an African-American man who's an elected official in an all-white district where he ran for public office. Michael is all about civil rights and getting people to move forward. No matter what he's done, no matter what board he sits on, no matter what his primary job, that's what he's advocating for. That's what he feels most strongly about. Down here, the expert advice. We had a number of these, but um, one of my favorites is Lisa Caputo, who is at Citigroup? Travelers. Travelers, thank you. Okay, so Lisa started her, started her career early on in the White House and on Capitol Hill. Her area of expertise was communications. And she was seen as very, very valuable because she understood the workings of regulators and, and, and others when she crossed over into a corporate job and became director of marketing. Okay, so she took those skills, that expertise, and moved it over from sector to sector. And finally? The fifth archetype uh, <laughs> was the late bloomer. Um, and uh, an example of that is uh, uh, Randy Pond. So Randy's currently the COO phasing out at Cisco after many successful years at Cisco. Uh, as Randy, Randy has built up a, quite a diverse set of affiliations, but we asked him how. How did how this come about? Uh, and, and Randy said, well, I was sitting there fat, dumb, and happy at Cisco, mm -hmm. doing just, just fine, working very hard. I was driving a lot of the M&A program that Cisco was extremely involved in for a number of years. And he said, somebody asked me to serve on a nonprofit board. And I checked with uh, my boss, and he said, uh, sure, go, go ahead, and we'll, we'll, we'll try and be helpful. Uh, Randy got into it. He really saw, uh, A, he felt great about the opportunity to learn about the community. Uh, he now runs, among other things, he ran all of their community engagement in the whole South Bay uh, to help them think about um, how, as a corporation, uh, they can be, be much more involved. It's dramatically affected, if you talk to Randy, how he thinks about his career now going forward, what he's gonna do with all the money he's uh, accumulated over time, uh, and but it's a, it's a late-breaking phenomenon, and that's where we, we saw a number of these leaders kind of come to it late in life. So we did ask them, um, so how did your specific path come about? Uh, and, and we really felt we saw two themes to that. The first theme, and it was just striking how many people use the word serendipity to describe their, their path. They explained it in terms of moves that their network, the people they got to know, who then connected them to opportunities that would otherwise have been invisible to them. So it was, it was network driven opportunity creation and then an openness of mind on their part to think about making the switch. The logical component though was there was often to connect those opportunities, there, there was often a kind of theme. We couldn't quite tell if that was generated before as part of a very strategic effort or in hindsight as they looked to connect all of those dots. But it might be a drive towards service. 
uh, desire to give back. It might be a push to broaden expertise, right? So Laura Tyson, uh, economic P uh, PhD in economics from uh, MIT, uh, went in a, in a variety of ways. Rather than going deep, Laura tended to accumulate these ever-broadening set of e experiences that really gives her quite a rich and robust understanding of economic uh, theory in, pr in practice. Uh, there's others, right? People use it to develop talents, to explore a passion. Some of those archetypes give you a good sense of uh, how those uh, dots can be connected. Most of the people we talked to said they never had a career plan, right? They just, they just had a rich network that they continued to develop and uh, some things that they thought were important. Could I just jump yep. in there? It was actually only two people that we interviewed out of 20-some that said they really set out to do exactly what they've done. Now think about that, two out of 25 is pretty low for people who ended up exactly where they thought they were headed to begin with. So most of these folks that we uh, interviewed and looked at had careers characterized, we would say, by unusual, unpredictable tax that built on each other in some way uh, to create a new set of opportunities. The image a lot of them would describe was not a career ladder, but a career spiral, where they would end up in these tacks would take them to different, different ways, always building on each other, always creating in turn a new set of opportunities, but ones that they, they really couldn't, couldn't predict. So we next asked them about the costs and the benefits of all of these cross-sectoral affili affiliations. And at a high level, uh, they all said, look, the benefits dramatically exceeded the costs. Uh, and we'll talk about both of those. Randy said, look, I became a more a mature and skilled executive. It was more of an incremental change. He would describe it in his case. Others, Roger Ferguson, who's the CIO, CEO of TIA CREF, uh, said, just comes out and says, these have been trans transformational for me. I got opportunities I never otherwise would have had by virtue of some of these tax and the, and the, the people uh, I met along the way and the skills that I built along the way. So when we asked him about costs and benefit, the costs were a pretty predictable set of stuff. It takes time. You know, early in your career to go serve on a nonprofit board or uh, help out on a political campaign or whatever it might be. Uh, that's time that they're pulling away from their day job. They, uh, a number of them were very straightforward. They said, in hindsight, I probably pulled that time away from my family, from other things, right? But for them, it was important. Uh, in some cases, it cost them money narrowly for the job that they were doing. Uh, they talked about foregone focus. In a world of breadth versus depth, these are all pretty much people who seem to trade in favor of breadth at the expense of depth and deeper, deeper knowledge. It's very interesting as we we did some done some focus group with students here, and they have a mindset which is you really have to go deep and get very very uh, uh, skilled in a in a in a certain topic. Almost none of these leaders would describe it that way. They say when you look at the skills you need X years down the road. Uh, it's impossible to predict. So it's the broader, more applicable skills as opposed to the specific technical knowledge that they thought was valuable. And then they also were clear in saying, look, all these transitions, whatever they are, have a cost. Uh, Bob Reich described it as uh, coming in and out of the bends, that there's just a transactional cost to making a, making a shift. They all believe, though, that overall it accelerated their career in a, in a very significant way. When we asked about benefits, and we'll go into a bit more detail, they saw them in the three categories of professional benefit for them in their career, organizational benefits for the organization they were leading at the time we talked to them, and personal. Okay, so I want to bring some color to this and share with you some of what we heard about those benefits. From, from these leaders. And the first grouping is the professional benefits. And basically what people said was it accelerated their career. Okay, we had two people explicitly say they would not be in the position they are in right now 
had they not had this multi-sectoral background. <coughs> but the search committee in some way was looking for this background to hire the next CEO. But the other main areas, you, you see a number of them, we want to focus on two. One is networks. So Roger Ferguson said, I wouldn't downplay the effect of the Rolodex and who one knows. You need to stay in different systems and invest in your networks. And he made it real clear to us, he was not talking about the kind of network training that you often get in professional, in professional schools. It was really a sense of curiosity and interest and in engaging in conversations with people who are different from you and building those different networks that really expand you. The other area we want to emphasize is really about skills. So um, Alberto Ibarquan said, my networks, I'm sorry, I've picked up a number of ideas on how to manage people by seeing a variety of different systems and approaches, so the HR side of things. He also said his broad experience has helped him be cool in a time of crisis. It's another skill he's developed. Okay, So you can see these start to, starting to, um, to gather. On the organizational side, there were a number of benefits, but we, we want to emphasize three of them. One is, again, from Barbara DeSore of Bank of America. She said, our local market presidents, Bank of America has a really deep program in developing their people, so they'll look at what skills people need to get and what the organization needs, and they will strategically place them on nonprofit boards outside the organization to develop those skills. So she says, our local market presidents know local nonprofits and their needs, which is key to knowing our market, right? So it's a market benefit to organizations to have these multi-sector leaders. Um, Mark Tursik at the Nature Conservancy said, a big part has been in recruiting great people to the senior team, people who knew outside of the Nature Conservancy, some of them at Goldman Sachs, some elsewhere. And he then summarized, it may be my greatest contribution to the Nature Conservancy. And finally, Randy Pond talked about business development. He said, we actually got business in the nonprofit sector that we would have never gotten had I not been more involved. Okay, so some of the organizational benefits from where the person is seated um, as their primary position. The personal benefits, I, I will say, were the real surprise to me. Um, we didn't expect them to be as compelling as they were. So people talked about Barbara DeSur at Bank of America, talked about, I love to learn. It's important to my intellectual style and mind expansion. Or somebody like Mark Tursik said, this was a surprise, we heard this from a number of people actually, about their families. Mark Tursik said, for my four kids, it's enriched their lives. It helps them understand how society comes together to solve really tough problems. And Lenny Mendoza from um, McKinsey, who was a kind of expert that we, we talked to, said, it's all my daughters talk about is my external activity, not what, I'm not what I've done at McKinsey. Mm -hmm. It's what they're proud of in me. So there's a very, very strong personal edge to this as well. I can add my own, right? I was at McKinsey for 25 years. I was the chair on the board of the zoo. I was chair of the board of the zoo. What do you think my kids talk about? Dad, what's, <laughs> what's consulting like? Yeah, no, I never got that question even once, but Dad worked at the zoo, and that was very cool. Does McKinsey run its practices based upon, are, are, are you slotted either in, in, in private or in public sector and NGO, or as a McKinsey consultant, do you go across the my, I mean, my history was all over, all over everywhere. And it, again, in the early days, it was you did this other stuff on the sly, and you really didn't tell your partners uh, very much about it. Over time, we created the nonprofit practice, and we've tried to make it a more committed effort to help the leading institutions in the nonprofit it's sector. Easy to move between the, the different uh, it, uh, it, I don't want to say e easy, but it, it, yes, people do, people do move. You see a lot of movement. Uh, I'll tell you this, the younger generation, right, and I'm clearly dating myself as somebody about 30 years out of business school, uh, you know, the pendulum swings. And uh, I would say right now the generation of folks coming out of business school are very much uh, looking for a way, how do I make a difference in the world through what, through, through what I do, as part of what I do. I'm looking for places where I can do that. And so they're, they're, they're struggling with that question uh, a, a fair bit. 
And we saw the same thing at McKinsey. Now, you can't, it's very hard to make a career at McKinsey, I would say, trying to do that work. So you, you've got to be a good classic private or public sector consultant. We heard some other things from these folks, though, uh, uh, and I'll just touch briefly on them, right? Multi-sector approaches are on the, on the rise. We need executives who can operate at these inter intersections. They spoke of the different vocabulary, the different sectors used, and the need to build the, that vocabulary, the, meet, the need to build that style, the need to build familiarity with issues outside of their, out of their day job, and, and having people who can do that was attractive. A, a number of companies really saw this as a form of professional development. Not only companies, organizations see this as a form of professional development. And they actively encourage and support their leaders to get involved. Cisco has a very big system that Randy Pond, as I mentioned earlier, really helped put into place. B of A, a uh, very explicit effort to place executives in nonprofits. They give them nonprofit board training. They give them resources to support them. So they really do view it as part of professional professional development. Even on the nonprofit side, uh, at CARE, our uh, current uh, CEO, Helene Gale, we saw getting serving on a for-profit board as a great chance to do professional development at the CEO level. Uh, we, a we ask almost everybody, does it affect who you hire? Right now that you've got this experience, does it affect who you hire? And we, for the most part, got an answer that said, I don't explicitly look for multi-sector multi experience. I do like to see breadth. I do like to see well-rounded people, people who have challenged themselves in other environments. Those are the ones who are more interesting, and if they're more interesting, we have a better conversation, and I'm more likely to hire them. So sometimes they're doing it just because of the characteristics of the people. The, the people themselves become more interesting. Every once in a while, it's again for the, the skills that they've developed. And then lastly, we talked to a number of headhunters and said, do you see much of this right now? And they really spoke to more and more executives looking for a way to move from success to significance. How do I, how do, I do more than just, uh, just make money? In fact, when Rich Lyons, who's our dean now, was at Goldman Sachs, he was the chief learning officer. And his job was to work with the um, owner partners, the top 1% of partners at Goldman Sachs. And he said that was the most frequent request he got in terms of their professional development. Help me know how I can do something that's really, really meaningful. I want to have some, some legacy in the world, not just that I came to Goldman Sachs or I made money or I did this. Really quick about the, the third point over here. What did you guys heard from leaders about the skills that people are getting by participating in those nonprofits or public? Do you hear that they are better in negotiation skills, working with a variety of people? What is the, yeah. I, understand the I understand the importance of doing that, right. but I really want to know what are the actually the you know, hardcore skills that they're getting? Yeah. So this, the skills vary on the, on, by, by background, but go right, ahead. Right, but a couple of just occurred to me immediately, which is, the necessity of working with very different kinds of stakeholders. You know, you have an exposure, whether you're nonprofit or public, that you just don't have if you're within a, a larger corporation. So that is one. Second one, just a little bit. Well, an bit illustration good. of that, Paul Odellini, who was CEO of Intel, when we talked, he goes, I did not appreciate until I got this role how much time I have to spend in Washington, D.C., working with public, public sector leaders because of the influence they can have on the value of my company, right? And, and he said, it takes you time to learn the vocabulary, learn about the issues they care about, the way they approach these issues. So people, you know, it, people spoke to hard skills, um, but people spoke to things like style and perspective as much as anything. This ability to understand where different people are coming from in whatever role they're playing and use that to drive the perfor their performance and the performance of their organization. I would think people at the Clinton Initiative would probably get this part, and that is that uh, what also has been happening, and you may not be picking this up in the data, okay? I, don't, I don't think Barbara uh, Moore, for example, would know this, but she would know this from her background before she was even an MBA student here. That there's increasing global integration because of 
technology platforms. Right. And because of the way we have also developed the management sciences to make for a lot of integration across these, across multinationals privately and across right. sectors. Right. And so there's going to be lots and lots of common skills That's that right. go across those areas. But yes, the stakeholders are different. Right. The other one that I had to forgotten for a moment was um, doing more with less. Okay? Working with limited resources and getting it done anyway. So that kind of grit. So, so we asked, uh, what advice would you give to next, the next generation uh, of leaders? And they really came up with five, five things. The first, almost every, everyone we talked to said, start early. This is not something you jump into late in life. You, you know, if you've done nothing uh, across sectoral lines and at age, four, age 45 or 50 you say, gosh, I want to go run a nonprofit. You're not going to be a credible candidate. You need to show the history that you've been working in that arena. So you bring a, a very good point because as you went through this talk, I was thinking, okay, if I look at my life, I work, I have three kids, right? And I think I also have a responsibility to my family, right? Sure. And it seems that some of the changes that you mentioned, it makes sense for people later in life. Like if you think about an executive your people management skills, you can apply them to different mm -hmm. companies or different uh, like non-profit, public sector or private sector. When you are in the middle of your career, I think that that change is a lot more difficult. You become an expert of an industry or a, a function, and it's a lot harder to do those changes. Plus, you are in a time in your life where you have more <clears throat> time commitments. So, <coughs> I think that it's great, uh -huh. but at the same time, I don't know, like, of those leaders that you looked at, yes. at what age did they really start? That's a great question. I'll just jump in with one, because we, we had the same question that you have now. Um, and so we talked to somebody who is the vice chair of a, a nationally known nonprofit. She's a litigator. She's an expert in election fraud. She flies all over. She's a partner in a well-known law firm, right? And she has twin boys who are nine years old. And we asked her, you know, how do you do it? And she started at 28. Okay, so she was one of the people who said start early. One of the reasons she gave, which I found fascinating for how she had gotten involved or how she figured out how to do it was that in high school she had been a competitive skier and she had to figure out how to get five hours a day in for skiing, right? The other thing, she, she'd been elected like um, class president, and so she had to fit that in too. So from her, it was, you develop really, really good time management skills. Not to say it's not hard, mm -hmm. right? And there are sacrifices. She said, for instance, I probably don't spend, I could have a few more hours a month or a week with my twin boys, but they wouldn't, then wouldn't see their mom out there fighting for something that's important. So, you know, there are trade-offs, but absolutely, it's, it's tough. But she is the example, right? Her nonprofit early on was Colorado-based election-related right. issues, and she slowly built up a, a profile around that, got involved with the local common cause, right. and is now leading a major law firm's practice area because of the expertise she built up largely through her extracurricular right. Uh, act activities, right? right. And, and I, I would just under, underscore, it's, this is one of the things, we, so we've done focus groups with students on this. What are the challenges in making this work? And it is getting your head around that this is stuff you make time for. It has per personal benefits, it has professional benefits, uh, and in the act of doing it, uh, you learn how, you learn a set of valuable valuable skills but they also get get started early um, because you don't know where it's going to head uh, the second thing they said to us was you know play to your passions uh, do things that interest you uh, this is this is nights and weekends type stuff so you want to make sure you're doing something you care about they also said the key to success here is be fully engaged in, in what you do, whatever role, whether you're helping on an ele election, whether you're uh, on a nonprofit board, 
uh, you know, the people who have nonprofit board directorships are missing the point. They would argue it's it's important to be really and deeply engaged in some of these things, even though it's not your day job. Uh, they 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 spoke of the need, uh, and you you've heard us talk about it, to really think about your network, that your network uh, needs to be needs to connect you to different ecosystems, different kinds of people, uh, and that you need to invest in and nurture that network. They, they talk by way of contrast about people who, who go very deep uh, in an area. Their networks tend to be of people very much like themselves. Uh, the, the, the phrase in academia is the echo chamber, right? It's where you're going to say something most of the people you talk to are going to agree. These folks say, look, I, I benefit most from people who bring different perspectives. Uh, and, and they invest in those. Again, Roger Ferguson said, I don't do cocktail parties. I'm terrible at that kind of stuff. That's not how I do this. But it's, but it's I like to be, uh, I'm very good at uh, his kind of knowledge of financial institutions. That brings me into new arenas, and that's how I expand my network. And we talk about content. Uh, and knowing Roger, uh, he's not somebody you want, you, you'd love to be at a cocktail party with him, but you gotta talk about a problem. Um, they all talked about getting out of your comfort zone, particularly early on in, in, in your career. So if this is your comfort zone, this is where the magic happens. You want, if you want to grow personally, uh, it's putting yourself in those positions where you are not necessarily uh, comfortable. Uh, you can, uh, uh, and they said, only there, only when you do that do you, do you truly grow uh, and develop. And then lastly, they, they spoke to the need to having an open mind. Um, it was very striking as we talked to these folks and we talked about these, some of these career moves uh, they made. And you know, you can, the rational you can sit there and say, boy, that was a risky move. Why'd you do that? Um, and these folks seem to be characterized by an unusual amount of openness to the unusual opportunity. They tended to not see, when they looked at these opportunities, they ascended, tended to see the opportunity for growth as opposed to the costs and the risks. And they, it, you know, this group looking backwards said, and that was for the most part right. It, that was in fact how they benefited. So five bits of advice to, to the rest of us, I guess I, I would say, in terms of how to think about this. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this next slide and just go to reflection. So you're hearing this. We're sharing what we heard, what we saw from 2,000 leaders, what we heard in depth from about 25. How does it strike you? What do you think? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting because uh, we questions together. So, I'm, I'm kind of that one of those candidates where I have a, 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 a breadth of experience, but, but not the depth. Okay. And at the time, I was methodically adding on foundation pieces. But the reality is, talking about kind of reality, that I've used graduate school a couple times to, to differentiate getting an MBA and have a or a psych degree. Okay. You know, or an OD change management. Right. But here's, here's what I was finding and what they didn't tell me, even though that was going to my job, is you come out with a solid education background from like here, like a good institution. But I was still even trying to, with the search firms, getting into, they want the second baseman, but they don't want the utility infielder. And I found I was able to get out of the niche uh -huh. through grad school. That was my intent. And so this is, is for the, like, like the woman behind me said, it seems it's valuable maybe at the executive level but I'm wondering for, for those of us who have been through programs to try to differentiate, who are stuck with a few years of good experience, those transformational skills, I'm finding a lot of resistance and I don't mind trying to like sell myself and, mm -hmm. and what those skill set are, but I'm not finding, they're, they're picking the software engineer, the, the linear path, I uh -huh. find. I'm running against people who are, it's easy enough to pick the linear path and to take the gamble on somebody who actually might be a real benefit to the organization because mm -hmm. of their breath, mm -hmm. but they're not seen. And I'm just wondering. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know because I don't know how, and with that new career profile, I'm getting stuck right. in trying right. to Right. It's not your overcome. experience to date. Yeah. It's not your experience so far. Let me hold that and get other people to weigh in. Yes. 
this feels analogous to me to, I don't know, 20 years ago, high school students start, were starting to get told that great grades were not enough, uh -huh. that a list of I extracurricular see. things were required, or schools were increasingly competitive, finite number of seats at great universities, right. but fewer population of students coming out, so you better play an instrument and be in this program and have uh -huh. uh -huh. or whatever uh -huh. in order to compete with students of uh -huh. And it, this, this sounds like it's just the same thread. Now it's just uh -huh. moved X number of years later that coming out of school, um, that having great grades and maybe a focus in a particular area is not enough, mm -hmm. that instead that extracurriculars are going to be required even for someone moving into their late 20s, 30s, 40s, etc. Right. So more of a burden. Yeah, yes. A Hold on. Yes. I'm personally having somewhat of a violent reaction in that most of your examples are fairly linear. I mean, from the governor to head of Homeland Security to head of universities, not that crooked. Uh -huh. I'm wondering if you have anyone who was a school teacher and then worked on a farm and then played baseball <laughs> and then ran the Nature Conservatory. I mean, that's a curved line. Uh -huh. Most uh -huh. of your lines are pretty straight, actually. I mean, so if you run for-profit and run a uh -huh. non-profit. Granted, there's different uh -huh. customers, there's some differences, but there's something else missing. I it just hold like on. That, let's, let's, like that curve to me. I'd like uh -huh. a comment from the conservative industry. I, I think these are fairly uh, ragged curve. lines. I work in an engineering firm where mm -hmm. you know, literally it's you go from a junior design role to a, um, you know, a senior design role to a uh, project manager engineering role, where it, that, that is that is many how you're taking one project, you'd be, you'd be on a path. 18 months, you go on to the next one, which is a cookie cutter, which was 20% bigger. So I, I, I see, it's a bit of a, a, a perspective thing. Because um, I, I hear your point, though. I mean, uh, there are more radical lines, but, um, um, but uh, you know, having, having worked with people who stayed in the same company for decades in the same town, um, yeah, some of this does pretty good. There's even, even more linear. Let's get some more voices here. The thing that strikes me is you have to be good at creating serendipity. And that sounds like an oxymoron. Uh -huh. Right. But right. you know, they talk about connect to different ecosystems, get out of your comfort zone. I think that's the thing to, to capture, and maybe that's the skill inside of this to help people understand. Okay. That's how you can create this, make this kind of thing happen for yourself instead of just let it find you. Uh -huh. I think that's that's a skill I see you need to develop to make this work. Okay. All right. Yes. One of the contradictions I saw is they say uh, start very early. Yeah, one of your bullets says that I think with Cisco encourages their leaders to get involved, not their rank and file employees, uh -huh. and not their fresh out of college grads. Uh -huh. like, are companies actually encouraging the people that aren't leaders right. to get involved? Yeah. Right, right. When does this hit? When does right. this value really hit? At what stage? Yes. I also don't see how this addresses the the issue of missed opportunities when you are going linear. Um, for someone who's rising up the ranks as an uh -huh. engineer, uh -huh. you know, as they rise faster because they're going in that very specific line of uh, uh -huh. momentum, right. they're able to influence change when they get to that seniority level faster than uh -huh. if they go a lot of zigzags. Right, the lateral, straight arrow yeah. moves. Uh -huh. So there is that option, there is that aspect of missed opportunities, you know, should you go linear to, right. to a point of leadership. Right. Interesting, there were a couple of um, quotes that uh, I'm going to paraphrase in response to that. One of them was that um, the, the shelf of half-life of any knowledge that you gain now is going, to be, is going to be really diminished. So when you think about specialization, right, and what you know, it's not going to last like it has in the past. So that, that's the danger. That's the other side of the coin. Um, the other one just eluded me. What was it? Well, I, th I think the thing I would add is it's, it's not always job hopping. Yeah. Right? That's the classical view. I, I think it is people, you know, who are going up a, a corporate ladder, so to speak, but it's the other things they are wrapping around that while they, while they do it that develops the broader set of skills, the broader set of perspectives that makes them more interesting and ultimately more successful. Yeah. So the other yeah, example, let missing, me just... You're missing the most critical part of this. And the most critical part is the third bullet point in that what, what can Haas help students do to prepare for their new careers? And it's not just the new students. If I will, I'll make a really stupid jump and I will say, that Sergey Brin wrote in the in Times Magazine three years ago, front cover of a February issue, it said 2045. 
And that was the year he predicted we were going to all be able to live forever. And we know that um, when if we, if we, if we go back and even three Sundays ago and take a look at Fareed Zakaria's Global GPS show on 21st century moonshots, and you see the major projects that are going on around the world, some of which you see Medical Center as part of the Harvard Medical School. Our whole area is, uh, is involved in these things. There's these basic quests to move the production possibility frontiers out and to, because of intellectual curiosity and also because of world requirements to try to push the constraints and the parameters out. Right. Right. While that's happening, what Haas Business School can do to better prepare the students for living forever, working forever, is to be able to improve the way we network. And with that network and using our institutions to be able to enable us to make and to engage more in innovation and to connect, to walk in to events, not as hopeful employees trying to sort things out, but to be able to say, yes, as school teachers, as truck drivers, we understand mission critical things. We want to engage others in our mission critical uh, activities, our entrepreneurial events. We want to know how to match talent, passion, with capital. Okay, thank you. Um, let me go back because I remember the thing I, that I was thinking of, which was um, the people talked about the risks of the linear career. I don't think we've hit that very strongly. Like Paul Odolini, who went you know straight up the career ladder in technology and became CEO of Intel. He talked about when he became CEO, he was dumbfounded. He did not know that 15 to 20 percent of his job would be dealing with government. And he had no preparation for it. He didn't know where to go. He didn't know the language. None of that. So there, there's a downside to everything, right? So we said some of the downsides of this kind of multi-sectoral career. It's the time. It's not having the expertise. There's a downside to, to the linear career that we heard from people as well. But let's let's move to what should Haas do? Well, I have a question. Uh, sure. Slide back. You mentioned a lot of people went into nonprofit or something to, uh, as part of a legacy. They appeared to reach at a certain age. Uh, yet you are saying start early is an essential thing. So I'm not quite sure what you are uh, right. measuring there. Is right. Really, if you need this this uh, rep to do well at an early stage, or you just get to a later stage and then decide to run. Right. Focus. So there were a couple people in our sample who waited till later to get involved. But the vast majority of people said you need to get involved earlier. And they can cite and the only the examples in their own career of things they did that were quote outside the day job, whatever the day job was, that contributed to them gaining experience across sector lines. Um, you know, whether it was working on a political campaign, joining a nonprofit board, uh, you know, having a a stint through a corporation, a well-run company, to learn how uh, companies uh, actually work, supply chain, et cetera. There's just a, a uh, th these leaders kind of said, if you don't start early, you don't get into the opportunity flow. Uh, you're, you're, you tend to have, be restricted to the network you have, as opposed to dramatically multiplying that network. And in their experience, says it's that network that then cr creates that unpredictable set of opportunities. Yeah. So. so one thing that's interesting to me is that uh, you know, these professionals with the interest and the passion to sort of jump into nonprofit and public sector uh, work. You know, and then there's a question of you know, where does the match happen? You know, yes. What are those organizations doing to sort of show you where they need your skill set, how do you find them, usually the constraints are on family, time, right. location. Right. So where's, you know, what's going on to actually like make this happen? Right, right. And I think the answer is very little formally. It's coming out of the networks. It's coming out of the people that they actually know who would like to do something. Otherwise, you're right, formally, 
you know, when you leave Haas, for instance, any of you who've graduated recently, did we talk to you about this stuff? Did we set you up for success here? You know, did, did we even know that it was important and could influence your career? No, but this is what we're hearing. Yes? I was just reflecting that there was nothing in my business school experience that demystified the boardroom. Like, right. I didn't know what it meant. I just knew that there was some legal responsibility and there right. was governance and oversight. And that was like it. And I would right. read about these things in newspapers all the time. Right. And so the first time I was in a boardroom after business school, it was learning on the fly and grabbing mentors and using network. I've done that a lot in the prior decade, but there was nothing that prepped me. Right. Right. There is just, in point of fact, Paul actually teaches a course on boards in the spring. So starting about, I don't know, six, nine years ago, we ne and we now do have that available for people. And each year we have about 100 students who for no credit, no stipend, actually serve on nonprofit boards. Okay, so we have rectified that one, because you're right. It's not just people from Haas. A lot of people go on nonprofit boards with no idea how to read like a nonprofit financial statement or what are they supposed to be doing on a board. So yeah. Yeah, on the, on the Haas thing, um, I kind of got the feeling we, we did learn something in 2010. I mean, the okay. last week, social sector positions, et cetera. It was almost like you had to read between the lines a little bit. Yeah. So you guys put it, put out certain feelers, you were starting this research then, right. et cetera. There were, there were a few hints. Um, but it's almost kind of like we had to work out certain things for ourselves. That's right. And, and it's, uh, I'm finding some tension in education. How much do you put out there and spoon feed, give the recipe, et cetera, right. versus providing people with um, uh, examples, where to explore, et cetera. And, and I, think, I think the thing is reconnecting. Like a, this is an example for me since, since 2010. This is, this is the most um, clear example where we're closing the loop a few years later about how did the stuff we learned five years ago actually you know, um, how, how should I be starting to adapt it now? What, what opportunities I've missed in the last five years? What do I need to be doing mm -hmm. next, the next month, next year, to make some things happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, regarding what, so I think that class is doing right now, from I'm saying class of 2010, and the three things that I find extremely uh, um, valuable at that time was that, um, you know, after, you find, after you're done with your kind of like core courses, you know, I took my second year as basically trying to see, you know, taking courses of stuff that I don't know. So IBD was one example when, you know, went to a um, Brazil to work. That's an experience for me that I learned a lot from. The second one was uh, the public policy course that you know, I have no idea about public policy in the past, especially in the U.S. is coming from a different country. So that was an eye-opening. And I took uh, Kelly McAlenny courses about nonprofits okay. and how to get them. So overall, I think, I think that's you just just need to grab it, right? Uh -huh. So opportunities are there. There are the people who are highly focused on going to investment banking, to going to consulting, and they're taking their core courses. But overall, I think currently there is the opportunity for you to go beyond what you know right now, in half, especially in the second year, and just basically prepare for what we call the new career program. Okay, good. There were some hands here. Felix, and then. Okay, and uh, so what Haas is doing right, right now is a recent grad is the storytelling aspect to their business. Because I like how you say it's logical serendipity. It might be serendipitous how you were introduced to the opportunity, uh -huh. but it's absolutely not serendipitous why you survived in it, why you stayed in it for so long. Uh -huh. And that's part of reaching back into your story. Like that's who am I. Um, so I, will, I wouldn't, it's, a sh it's interesting that, uh, and I hope that I think Haas is preparing students better now to tell their story so they don't end up 60 years later saying it was just serendipity. Mm -hmm. Oh, it just uh -huh. happened. It probably uh -huh. didn't. Uh -huh. Good. Good point. Yes. Uh, uh, one point I want to make is that uh, by, by listening to what you said, uh, I think uh, even though those leaders are zigzagging, uh, but every leader and every guy has a very strong street line, a short street line. They're doing really, really well. Mm -hmm. That's why when they accumulate the, the general skills and uh, capabilities, they can apply when they change the direction to different one. And, and uh, throughout their course, they're becoming general leaders. Uh, uh -huh. So coming back to what half can do to help the student, I think uh, first, the student have to know, they have to do their job, their job really, really well, and they keep a very strong curiosity to think beyond what they do. And I think they half can facilitate it with both of them, yes. and they can go into that. Yes, that's interesting you say that, because we heard curiosity a lot from the people that we interviewed. You have to be open, you have to have curiosity. Yeah. Yes? Okay. 
I think it'd be great to do a, a board match. Uh, a lot of the other schools do a board match. I don't know if that's mentioned. Yeah, we we do. Because um, it's not it's not well advertised. I sit on a number of boards. You mean for alumni or for students? Well, well for alumni, for okay. nonprofits, okay. or uh -huh. it might be well advertised for students. But I've been out for a few years. Uh -huh. But uh, I I'm involved with the Harvard Business School Community Partners. And uh -huh. I help out with Stanford a little bit. Right. Um, and I'd love to see more hospitals not only sit on boards but be involved. And then the other thing is we have, from my class, I think we had four people move back to their home country and start social mm -hmm. ventures. Yes. Um, a lot of them took classes with Kelly McElhaney and, and other folks. And I don't know what we're doing to support them, but they're doing really amazing things. Mm -hmm. Some were featured in the alumni magazine. Uh -huh. But um, there's not really a um, consorted effort to provide resources for them for these people who are doing amazing things. That's a good point. Because I, I flew to, I flew to go meet one of my classmates in India in December to help him raise social venture capital. Um, okay. Be, because there was not really any constructive, constructive effort for uh, some of our alumni back in, in India. Okay, good point, good point. One thing for anyone who does live in the San Francisco Bay Area is every spring, I believe, there's something called Board Match. It's put on by the Volunteer Center. And there are hundreds of boards there and people who are interested in serving on boards. And the alumni newsletter, I think, comes out and tells you when it is. And last year, we had 60-some Haas alumni there. So there is at least that small opportunity. I want you to know that. Yes. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Is, that, is that for, uh, is it on campus, or is it a conference outside of campus? It's conference outside the San campus, generally in San Francisco. And that's across alumni associations, right? Yes. Uh, but there's not one for us. No, there is not. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're time. Okay. I think we are time. <laughs> <laughs> we were supposed okay. to be three o'clock. We're on time. Flowing by two again.